Welcome to the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and serve the community. Whoever you are, we welcome you. Wherever you come from, we welcome you. Whomever you love, we welcome you. Whether your mind is stuck in the past or you're able to focus on the present moment, we welcome you. We welcome all of you. It is good to be together this morning. If you are here for the first time this morning, we especially welcome you. There is a link in the visitors form in the chat for you to fill out at your convenience during this service or afterwards. Please fill this out so that we can be in touch with you and offer you a full welcome. At the top of our online service, we want to invite each and every one of you to please remain muted throughout the service. When too many voices sing or speak together, it can create a cacophony of voices on our audio, which can disturb the flow and the experience of our worship service. As we gather this morning, we invite you to pop into the chat and offer a greeting. You can find this at the top or at the bottom of the screen with an icon and a text bubble and the word chat by it. So please pop on over and offer a greeting. It could be a wave of hello, and I'm here if you prefer. Welcome, welcome to worship at First Universalist. I invite you now to join together with everyone who's here, singing hymn number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath. called to gather and worship as a beloved community. We are called to set aside distractions and anxieties that we might touch deeper springs and be renewed. We are called to seek and to share comfort for the hurts that afflict. We are called to desire more love, more justice, and life more abundant. We are called to truth, to mercy, to humility, and to courage. Let us answer the call with the yes of our lives. As we light our chalice, will you join me in saying the chalice words in unison? May we be a people of welcome, here to grow in heart, in mind, in spirit, and may we reach out to serve our community. Please join me in our affirmation of faith, followed by our doxology. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, 
to serve humanity and fellowship to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. This congregation is a theologically diverse religious, religious community with membership open to all who are in accordance with our principles, mission, and vision. We are a welcoming congregation to people of all sexual orientations, and we unconditionally welcome any and all of you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow as spiritual and moral beings. Our congregation is entirely self-governed by democratic process. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and our institutional well-being. You are now invited to participate in the blessing of giving through the link in the chat or the donate button on our website. Thank you. I invite you into this reverent time of sharing the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, you can place your hand over your heart to be able to listen from this heart-centered place. As we place stones in the jar, I will read aloud the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. You are also welcome to read those that are typed into the chat box yourself. All are also invited to share your joys and sorrows in the chat right now that we may hear from the gathered community here. First, a joy and a sorrow about Phil Ebersole. 
Phil broke his collarbone when he slipped and fell in the shower Sunday night, and he is sorry that he is getting so accident prone, but he feels privileged to have access to good medical care, and he is happy and recovering okay. And it is a great joy to know that he is not alone, but part of this caring community. And I have spoken with Phil, and he does seem to be in good spirits, and he assures me that he has lots of support. I have an anonymous joy and concern. I am grateful to have a home to live in and for my dog and two cats and for companionship, but I am incredibly lonely. Friday, Patty and George celebrated an anniversary. A joy and a sorrow, happy not to be teaching face to face this semester, but definitely struggling with the extra time needed to do my courses online. A joy, Mary Kay is home after back surgery and doing well. So happy for both Susan and Mary Kay. A joy that I was able to take my poll worker training this last week and hope to work in early voting this election day. So sorry to see Jesse Werner died. Thank you, Richard, for sharing this news with us. A dear friend is having surgery this Friday. I will offer an apology. This computer is at some distance and the blue type that indicates people's names is hard to see with the lighting in here. From Hal Bauer, we will miss Jesse in our pews for many years. From Bridget Watts, sorrow and anger for the violence in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we drop one final stone into the bowl to represent all the many, many spoke, spoken and unspoken concerns which live in our hearts. May they be held and honored even as they are offered in silence. May all be held in the heart of love. I invite you now to join with me in a spirit of meditation and prayer. Take a deep breath. With every breath I take today, I vow to be awake. And every step I take, I vow to take with a grateful heart so that I may see with eyes of love into the hearts of all I meet to ease their burden when I can and touch them with a smile of peace. I invite you now to join together singing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. Thank you. 
This morning's reading is called Here, Now, You by Cat Louie. It begins with a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Breathing in, there is only the present moment. Breathing out, it is a wonderful moment. When I heard the venerable's robes rustle at what I estimated to be the 40 minute mark, and yet she still not give did not give the signal that our sitting meditation had ended. That's when I knew she would take us to the full hour. But my knees were complaining and my mind was bored with counting breaths. What to do in the time remaining? Suddenly, a stray thought entered. What if this were our last breath? Funny thing, I immediately began to breathe slower drawing in the air to fill every crevice of my lungs and then slowly pushing it out until there was nothing left to expel. Well, I thought, I must want to live. Of course, when I got to the end of that last breath, I was still there. So I began another breath, still asking, what if this were your last breath? There were flashes of regret, unfinished projects, loved ones grieving, but one breath isn't enough time to do anything about regrets. There is only enough time to experience the moment, to know that I was there breathing. Inhalation, exhalation. When the moment passed, there was the next moment and the next. And in this way, I spent the remaining 20 minutes entirely present. Outside of the meditation hall, we still plan for the future and we still think of the past. But so often, we replay past regrets and worry about future events to the point where we're no longer present in the present. As the Venerable says, we forget that we are breathing. Then she added this meditation. When stuck in traffic, waiting in line, or anytime there's nothing to do other than be present, find a comfortable position in which you can breathe freely. What if this were your last breath? Just for this moment, believe that this is all you have. No time to worry about the future or the past. Just enough time to know that you are breathing. Draw it in. Savor the sensation of your lungs filling. Savor your heart breathing. Savor the sensation of your chest relaxing as you inhale and exhale. Inhalation. Exhalation. Here. Now. You. Yeah.
spread like broken umbrellas. And parks and bridges, ponds and zoos, ruddy faces, muddy shoes, lights and noise, and bees and boys, and days. I Like people the world over, I took advantage of the COVID shutdown to organize my house. I started small by organizing the kitchen cabinets, and then I worked my way up to doing closets, and eventually in mid-April, I tackled the attic. Now, I have long wanted to ask an architect to explain to me exactly what the purpose of attics was. The period of full walk-up attics where they were features of houses is really, when you think about it, a relatively small one. About a 60-year period from between about 1870 until 1930 or so. Houses that were built before or after this time, if they have attics at all, have attics which are generally too low to stand up in, and you usually need some kind of a ladder to access them but our house was built in 1895. And so we have a full attic with a real full set of stairs going up to it. It's easy to get in and out of, and it is big enough to hold a lot of stuff. Now, those of you who have these attics know how things accumulate in them, especially as we age and we lose loved ones. There's plenty of room up there for our mother's china cabinet that just needs refinishing, our grandfather's wing back chair, which would be beautiful if it just had new fabric on it, and great Aunt Mary's desk, which just needs to have the leg put back on it. Well, our attic is just such a place. Every time someone in either of our families has died, a sibling or a cousin has said to us, you guys have that great big huge attic and we can't bear to part with mom or dad's such and such. Could we put it up there just for a while until we find it a home? So over the years, I have noticed that whatever the item in question, it is forgotten by the asker as soon as it is lugged up two flights of stairs covered with an old bedspread and tucked under the eaves next to the Christmas tree decorations. So this spring, with all that extra time, after 13 years, we gave ourselves permission to liberate ourselves from these items, items that we were holding on to simply because of their symbolic value. And we let go of the expectations of the relatives who have never returned to claim the items. And we spent a solid week up there sorting and donating and giving and throwing. It was extremely liberating. Extremely liberating to watch clutter yield to open space and self-care replace obligation. For years, Michael and I had held on to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that we didn't want simply because they represented people and places which no longer existed. And best of all, we found homes for most all of it, so I didn't have the guilt of having to send things to a landfill. 
I was right in the middle of feeling thoroughly happy with how everything was going when I found a box of pictures from the 1990s. Now, as much as I had done a good job of avoiding lingering over pictures and other memorabilia during this project, I could not resist poking through this box and looking at at least a few. My first Christmas tree as a homeowner, a now long departed cat, and then a picture of myself and my sisters taken when I was probably about 32. How youthful and attractive they both looked. Then my eye went to my own image and I was horrified. Oh, I did not look anywhere near how I remembered myself looking at that age. And it no doubt goes without saying that my memory was much more flattering than the photo. What struck me first was how much heavier I looked and how much fatter my face had been than I remembered ever looking. But it didn't end there. My hair? Ah, oh, did it really look that disheveled all the time? And the, those glasses? I thought they were flattering at the time, but they looked like the split windshield of an old Volkswagen. Did they really ever make glasses that big? And those clothes? How could I possibly have not seen how incredibly dumpy they made me look? And while I can find a little bit of humor in the situation now, I will admit that at first I was quite disturbed. How, how could I have looked like that in 1993 and not know it? How did I not see it? Why wasn't I thinner, better dressed? Why wasn't my hairstyle more flattering? Did I ever bother to look in a mirror to check it? What had been wrong with me? How could I possibly have not seen and fixed those things? And worse, <laughs> much worse, what had other people seen? Did I really look that awful all the time? What effect did that have on me? Had I missed out on opportunities because I looked so terrible? Had people felt sorry for me? Might I have dated nicer people, had better friends and a more successful career if only I had seen myself clearly enough to lose weight, dress better, and do something, anything with that hair? Were people feeling sorry for me? Had people snickered behind my back? Would I be happier? more popular, better loved, and more successful now if I had looked better then? Did I mess up the one chance I had to live the very best life that I could possibly have lived because I didn't present myself as well as I possibly could have? And it didn't stop there. Beyond looks, in what other ways, I started to wonder, had I not lived up to my true potential? Had I really chosen the right career? Had I chosen the best place to settle down? Had I worked as hard as I could? Had I studied as much as I might have? Did I ever really identify my real gifts and my real talents and develop them to their fullest potential? What of all the different things that I had tried? In addition to special education and ministry, at different times, I was enrolled in courses and studied counseling, social work, music, and creative writing. Were one of these really my true calling? What if I had stayed with music? Maybe, maybe I'd be singing professionally now, or perhaps I would be a beloved music teacher like the character in Mr. Holland's opus. Or if I had spent more time writing, maybe I'd be as successful of a writer as Ann Tyler is now. Had I stayed with counseling and social work, maybe I'd have a successful private practice by now, and that would be a lot less stressful than teaching special ed at my age. And on 
and on and on and on. My thoughts continued along this path, questioning and second guessing and wondering and regretting. My joy and my satisfaction about what was going on that day completely evaporated and it was replaced by an intense dissatisfaction. Although I couldn't put my finger on exactly where I had gone astray, I was sure that I had, somehow, somewhere, that I had missed out on the life I could have, and indeed should have, had. And all of this triggered by one unflattering picture taken nearly 30 years ago. I'm sure that we can all identify with at least pieces of this scenario. The rides that our minds can take us on if we let them. And yet, we do let them. We let them every day, all day, every day. And we rarely, if ever, question our thoughts. We simply let our minds take us on these journeys as if whatever it is that we are thinking about is actually happening right now. We identify with these thoughts and the feelings that they elicit in us as if they are objective reality itself. And in the process, we miss out on what is happening in the here and now. And we unconsciously sacrifice our joy and our peace in the process. Does any of this sound familiar? How often have each and every one of us had this experience? Think about it. You are happy and content and feeling peaceful and purposeful, and then an image or a thought pops up and takes you on a ride, a ride on which you question or fret or regret or judge. You remember a long ago injustice and your heart fills with fresh rage over it. Your mind touches on an ancient missed opportunity and you become consumed anew with regret. Or you think of a long lost love and you grieve it as if the loss were last night. We all do this. We all do this all the time. It is the human condition. The price we pay for having our uniquely human minds. Minds are such useful tools and our thoughts so constant and so pervasive that we give them complete and total power over us. Our thoughts and our judgments, it seems, are reality itself. And we live each and every day not really experiencing the present time and place, but instead experiencing our thoughts as if they are reality. When I lived in Buffalo in the 80s, I had an elderly friend who lived alone. Twice widowed and childless, in her late 80s, Marjorie spent the majority of her time alone. She had adopted my group of young gay male friends, and we took turns calling her every day to make sure that she was okay. Frequently, when one of us would call, she'd say something like, Oh dear, I'm not actually here. I haven't been here all day. I've been at the Grand Canyon, reliving my trip that Larry and I took there in the 1930s. And then she would go on to describe how everything looked and what she and her late husband were doing in her mind at the moment that the phone rang. Larry and I were just about to look at the sunset when the phone rang, she might say. In a little less deliberate way, this is how we all live. In a bubble of our own minds, tethered tentatively to the present by our bodies and by the immediate tasks that we have to complete, but not immersed in or fully experiencing where we are, what we are doing, or who we are with. And unlike Marjorie, whose thought bubble took her to pleasant and happy places, most of the time, most of us are revisiting negative times and places. Slights we may have suffered. 
injustices we endured, grief we survived, and regrets that we still nurture. Research has actually shown that on average, we have way more negative thoughts than positive ones, but they aren't just thoughts. They are alternative realities that we inhabit at least as fully as we inhabit the present moment. I had started out my day in that attic happy and fulfilled in the present. Michael and I had had a nice breakfast. There was a soft rain falling on the roof and we were up in the attic so it was right over our heads and it was very restful and peaceful. The temperature up in the attic was just right. We had accomplished more than I ever thought we possibly could have. I was feeling peaceful and fulfilled and joyful about everything that was going on. We were chatting away as we sorted, talking of all things about our favorite plants in the garden, when I found the picture. And instantly, I was gone. Away on a trip. Every bit as gone as Marjorie was gone to the Grand Canyon when we called, and every bit as vivid and real to me as that no doubt was to her. Michael could tell that my mood had changed, and it spoiled a lovely and precious moment. A few seconds of 1993 ruined a whole day of 2020. And yet, the sermonizer in me recognized the insights that I gained. The attic and the picture were metaphors for some lessons that I had understood intellectually for a long, long time, but hadn't fully connected with emotionally. My attic was full of emotional and physical baggage, stuff that I couldn't part with because of what it represented in my mind. I was holding on to most of these things because of the memories attached to them. Not because I needed, or really, to be honest with you, not because I even wanted them a pair of battered and hideously styled, hopelessly dated armchairs that I kept because my grandparents at once sat in them over 40 years ago and told me stories. My Aunt Jean's equally hideous and worn out dining room set, kept for the same reason, because my entire family had once when everyone was living sat on these uncomfortable, ugly, careworn chairs around this now three-legged, hobbled table. So much, so much of my time and energy had been spent into tending these things, as if somehow by holding on and preserving them, I was maintaining a connection not only to my deceased parents and grandparents and sister, but to all of the memories all of the memories which lived in my mind, and also a connection to who I myself had been back in those days. But these useless and hope hopelessly decrepit items were, in fact, a drag on my current life and a drag on the person that I am now. A burden which nagged at me every single time I climbed those attic stairs to get something that I actually needed in the present and had to climb over them or move them or rearrange them just so that I could reach the cushions for my outdoor chairs so that I could enjoy an evening on the porch in the now with my partner and dog or to get the papers I needed to renew my passport to take a trip in the present day. Like my thoughts, they tied me to realities which no longer existed and detracted from my enjoyment of what does exist now. And like the unflattering picture, the associations were replete with not only happy memories, but also with regrets, missed opportunities, grievances, and grief. Any memory or connection that I want to maintain, I can keep without keeping an attic full of useless items. 
And whether or not it feels sad to face it, face it, we must. They are only memories. Thoughts that exist nowhere but in my mind. And when my mind is someday stilled, they will no longer exist. I have been studying Buddhism for many, many years. Of all of the world's religions, it's the one which most speaks to me. Its simple wisdom rings true to me in all situations. My encounter with the unflattering picture and my reaction to it seems, to me anyway, to contain many of Buddhism's central tenets. When I looked at the picture, I made a judgment. Instead of just accepting what it was that I saw and moving on, I judged the way I looked, and I didn't like it. That led me to suffering because I wanted the picture to be something other than it was. I wanted to have looked thinner and better dressed in 1993. I then attached to this judgment, and I didn't let it go. This attachment took me out of the present moment and led me to identify with my thoughts as if they were reality itself. If I could have simply looked at that picture and said, hmm, that's what I looked like in 1993, and let it go, my mind would not have taken me on a day-long tour of every regret I've ever had. Obviously, 1993 is long over. And whether I looked like Rob Hudson or Quasimodo in that picture, I am only and can only be who I am now, in this moment. Now, I am sure that I have made some choices which have caused me to be less fulfilled than I might have been. But dwelling on them, in addition to being futile, is also a function of ego. Why should I be any more special or any more fulfilled than anybody else? And by the way, isn't that whole thing a real first world white privilege problem anyway? And what of the thought train that I boarded? Besides the fact that it took me away from the present moment, how accurate were those thoughts anyway? We have all seen pictures of other people that we recognize as not being accurate portrayals of the subjects. So think about this. Doesn't it stand to reason that pictures of ourselves could sometimes be that off as well? <clears throat> and as for regrets, life is in many ways a linear experience, which affords at any given moment a limited number of choices, especially when it comes to careers. I could not possibly have been a singer, a music teacher, a novelist, a special ed teacher, a therapist, and a minister. And we always must keep something else in mind too, that when we hold these regrets, we make the assumption that we would have been successful and happy had we done the thing that we didn't do. Our minds are great gifts, but like any gift, Minds have their place. Our kidneys are just as necessary as our brains, but we don't confuse filtering toxins out of our blood with reality itself. And while this insight is far from new and far from mine originally, it nevertheless needs constant, constant reinforcement. In meditation, and any of those of you who have tried it, you will know, it is quite common to need a dozen reminders per minute that we must separate our thoughts and judgments from reality itself. And it always helps to get a different take on this idea from deep inside someone else's mind. The present moment is also almost always relatively peaceful and always, always full of beauty. If you don't believe me, try keeping track over this next week. As often as it occurs to you, pause, just pause, and focus on the present moment. And ask yourself some questions. Are you in pain? 
Are you in the midst right now of a crisis? Is your safety being threatened? Are you in need of some vital thing that you can't get like food or water? Are you happy? Now this one, this one is really crucial because if your answer to are you unhappy, if you say, am I unhappy? And your answer is yes, then you have to dig a little deeper and you must discern, am I really, really unhappy about what is happening right now, this minute? Or is the source of my unhappiness an event from the past or a projection about the future? Most moments when experienced by themselves as discrete events, not tied to the past, or future are good and beautiful and fulfilling. They may not be perfect, but they are definitely good enough. And think about this, if we add up all of the moments of our lives, each and every solitary discrete moment, we will find that the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them are good and fine moments. We will also find that we actually missed most of them, by the way, because we were paying attention to the musings of our minds rather than the perfection of the present. Let's covenant together this morning, especially as we seem to be in an unprecedented time of uncertainty. Let's covenant together this morning not to miss any more beautiful moments than we have to. Life is not a cohesive narrative. It is a string of individual moments. And if salvation is real, I believe that this insight is where we will find it. About a month after I found the picture, I found another box of pictures. And in this particular box, I found one of those pictures. You know those ones, most of us have maybe five or 10 of them in our whole lives. Those ones where we actually look even better than we thought we looked. It was such a flattering picture that it crossed my mind to scan it and put it on Facebook, but I didn't. Instead, I simply put it back in the box and I moved on with my day. Our final hymn is number 128, For All That Is Our Life. We invite you to remain muted and sing out joyfully from home again, creating a collective song wherever we find ourselves.
As we extinguish our chalice flame this morning, let us read together the words printed in the order of service. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. Though we cannot be seated next to one another, we are still connected in this community. As we come to a time to close our service, I want to invite each of you into an embodied practice of holding hands from a distance at the end of our service. If you are joining us by video, please change your view to gallery view rather than speaker view. And then reach your hands out to the edge of the screen. If you are here by phone, you may place your hand over your heart and bring to mind someone that you love from this congregation. Let your love flow outward. Through the universe, to its height, its depth, its broad extent, a limitless love without hatred or enmity. And then as you stand or walk, sit or lie down, as long as you are awake, strive, strive for this one-pointed mind your life will bring heaven to earth. And let the people of the church say, Amen. As we come to the time to close our service, I invite you to follow the benediction with the words, may I live in the now. Please join us in typing these words into the chat together.
I've looked at life that way. But now old friends are acting strange. They shake their heads. They say I've changed. Well, something's lost, but something's gained in living every day. I've looked at life from both sides now, from win and lose, and still somehow it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life.